Hello, my name is Dan Merrick, and I'll be your Ruby instructor for today's menu planning webinar. I have a background in plant-based cooking and have worked in that field for the past 15 years for companies like Whole Foods Market, nonprofits like Whole Kids Foundation, many culinary schools. I run my own vegan catering company, and I currently sit on the board of Slow Food and the Institute of Childhood Nutrition. Today, we'll be talking about menu planning batch cooking, and planning ahead for a successful week of meals. Before we start our class on menu planning, a couple of housekeeping items. On the right-hand top of your page, you'll see a dialog box that says, add questions here. If you're inspired to ask a question or make a comment, type it in, and it makes it way to a queue that I can see on the right-hand side of the page. You can also upvote questions by hitting the heart-shaped icon and the individual questions, and we'll answer those with a little more votes just a little bit sooner. So let's get started on menu planning. Although all the menu items that I've picked for this demonstration are plant-based meals, this information can be used in any eating style by simply switching some of the menu items out. Menu planning is an essential part of my week. When I come from home, when I come home from work, I typically have only about 15 minutes to get food on the table for my family of four. In order to do that, I have to plan ahead. It really starts by creating a menu. I sit down and map out for the week so I can find out what days I'll have a little bit or a little less time to cook, what can be used for leftovers for the next day for lunch, and what needs to be made fresh on certain nights. I typically make about four to five dinners some lunch items that can be used for salads or sandwiches. I love making overnight oats. I do mise en place for salads and other fresh meals and some batch cooking of dried beans and grains. Once I have a menu, I'll refer to recipes and break them down into a shopping list to make sure that I'm going to have all the food that I'll need when I start prepping for the week. So here I am on prep day. This is typically the day where I either get my groceries delivered or I go pick them up. Now what I'm gonna do is put all of the things that need to go in the freezer in the freezer right away. And I'm gonna put all my dry goods in the pantry. But then I'm gonna get out all my produce, put them out and start cutting up to be able to make my mise en place. Now I actually created a list beforehand and a shopping list to be able to go through to know exactly what I'm going to cook for the week. I make a list like this every single week and it lists off all the different menu items that I'm actually going to prepare. Now some of these I'm going to prepare ahead of time to make it easier during the week. So before I even start to go shopping, I'm gonna clean out everything out of my fridge and throw out anything that hasn't been used from the week before and put any leftovers down so they're accessible first. So I really highly suggest getting some uniform Tupperware. That way they store easily and uh, they all come apart like this too, so we can just stack them up to be able to go in there. Now they have nice lids too, so as we put them on, you're easily able to stack them in your refrigerator too. And I'll typically use something like this where I'm freezing all of my scraps to be able to make a stock. I make that every week just to get myself started here. So now that I have water in all of these, I'm gonna start them boiling and bring them down to a simmer. I'm gonna do this all as I'm starting to cut up all my vegetables. That way, this part of it is going to be pretty close to done by the time I have my vegetables chopped up.
So now my quinoa is actually done here. So I'm just going to let this cool down a little bit. And then I'm also going to put it into a container just like I have all the rest of my mise en place. So it's ready for a meal midweek. My stock is still going. My chickpeas are done as well. All right, so I actually have my tofu marinating. I pressed it already. I didn't show you that on camera, but here's in the background. And I have a pan here just waiting and uh, nothing in there. Um, as most of you have taken the class, um, you know what I'm doing. I'm actually gonna take some mushrooms and a little bit of onion. And what am I waiting for? That little ball to be able to form from the bottom here, like mercury. It looks like it's gotten up there. So I'm gonna add some of my onions that I've already prepped. Let those sit and saute just a little bit. So now my onions are basically just starting to stick a little bit. I'm gonna deglaze just a little bit, a little bit of water just to get all that brown off the bottom of the pan. Then I'm gonna add my mushrooms straight in here. Now this is great because I'm gonna actually caramelize these and do this no oil saute. So I have them for later in the week. All right, so I've switched things around a little bit. I've moved my stock to the back to let it cool down a little bit before I strain it off. And I have my mushrooms cooking here in the center. I'm actually gonna get started on a tofu scramble here. I'm just gonna put some oil in there. I'm gonna get it going and then put in my onions and my mushrooms right away to be able to get my tofu scramble started. So again, I'm just using what I've already chopped up here. So it's great to already have that mise en place done. All right, now these mushrooms are still cooking. I have these onions and mushrooms cooking as well, and a little bit of oil. And now it's time for me to actually add in my tofu for my tofu scramble. So um, this is a little different than the recipe that we have on the Ruby website. They don't actually include mushrooms. Uh, I just like it in these. You know, typically there's pepper that's in this uh, recipe as well too. But that's a great thing. After you've been through these classes, you can switch it up a little bit. You know, use the knowledge that you've learned in these classes to be able to diversify some of these recipes. If there's an ingredient in there you don't like, well, switch out the ingredient. That's totally fine. So now while these dishes are going at the same time, my tofu's been marinating long enough that I can actually just put this into the oven and let it bake. Now, this is the same one that's uh, listed on the Ruby website. There are a couple different marinades that you can do with this if you'd like. But the great thing is this goes by pretty quick, and it's something you can do while you're cooking all these other dishes. So you see I have two dishes here. My oven just said that it's preheated. It's ready to go. So I'm going to let these bake off and set a timer so I don't forget about it. Because that's the thing, as you're doing a lot of different things, sometimes you need to add timers just to make sure that you're not forgetting it. Now that I have my tofu done, these mushrooms are done, so I'm going to turn them off and let them cool down. My tofu scramble is done as well. So now I'm just going to let everything cool down before I put it in my containers in the fridge. And I'm going to start working on a couple other recipes. I'm going to get out a blender and make my dressing. Now a lot of you might be wondering why I'm doing this in the blender. I actually like to take my fresh herbs and put them in like this. That way it actually emulsifies really, really well into this. I'm going to let that sit overnight to be able to get the best flavor out of it. A lot of you have done the manicotti from scratch. It's actually a great recipe and it's super popular. Now, one of the more challenging parts of that is actually doing the dough, and it's pretty time consuming. So, so I've actually taken that recipe and made it really simple and easy to do. Basically, I'm going to take some pasta sauce already done, just put a little down on the bottom of my dish here, and I'm taking regular lasagna noodles. I've cooked them and just let them cool down a little bit. Now they're really pliable, they're still a little al dente. I'm going to take the inside and stuff it with that ricotta that I made earlier, and then just line my dish with that. It's actually a really easy way to be able to get one dish done pretty darn quick because I'm cheating a little bit, right? Now, for special occasions, I absolutely always do the dough from scratch. But for a weekly basis, this is just an easy way to be able to do it. So 
now I'm actually starting on my potato leek soup. I also put some rice on too, and my tofu is done. So it was done baking there. So I can actually set that aside to be able to cool off. And at the same time, I actually just roasted up some broccoli too. You know, using the same space, different trays works perfectly. So now that I have this going, I have my mise en place all set up right up here. So I'm going to dump in my leeks and about the equivalent of one onion. And I'm going to let that cook and just follow the recipe until I put my potatoes in next. Now after my tofu's cooled, I'm just going to stack it in here to be able to use for sandwiches later. All right, so now I'm going to put in the rest of my potatoes and my hot stock just to cover those potatoes. When my rice is done, so I'm actually going to move that to the back burner and do a little pickling so I can pickle some red onions just for the sandwiches and other things for the week. So now my pickling liquid is actually hot enough. On our recipe, it doesn't say to heat it. I always find it works better. Plus it helps to create a nice seal for this too. This is that same red wine vinegar onion. I'm just gonna seal that up. And then <clears throat> now my soup is done too. Now you can actually empty out this one into a blender. I'm just gonna use an immersion stick like this to be able to blend it on up. I'm gonna do that before I actually strain it. Well, that was a lot of cooking. Now, don't start that just at first. Try a couple dishes and then work your way up to that. I've been doing this for years, so I can do a lot of dishes and a lot of different things at once. Now, if you keep practicing on this, you can end up with a great looking refrigerator set up with your mise en place for meals for the week and meals for the week that you just have to heat up. I hope that this technique works for you and your family to be able to make it so you can eat healthier every day. You can see there's our soup, <clears throat> some leftover stock, and then all of the stuff that we prepped today. We're totally set up for the week. as you go and you feel more comfortable. I hope that this demonstration has helped you get some ideas on how you can do this yourself and set yourself up for success for the week. I'm going to open it up for questions from our chat now and mail-ins. So I see that our first one here that has a lot of upvotes is asking about cooking for her husband and herself, making complicated meals with lots of ingredients, which she likes to do, and it seems difficult for two people. Often leftovers don't work and I hate to waste food. Do you have any advice? That's actually a common problem. Um, you know, one of the first things that I do when I'm planning out my menu is to look at what ingredients I'm using for each menu item. If you actually look below the box where this, uh, where a display is, there's an event document and it actually has uh, the all the menu for the week that I planned out and then what I'm going to make ahead of time, and then my mise en place as well. Now, if I go through and look at all those ingredients, I try to overlap them 
to be able to make sure that I'm using similar ingredients um, for um, you know, the similar menu items. That way I'm not having a lot of leftovers as well. The other great thing is if you're creating a menu for yourself ahead of time, you know about how much of an item you need to actually get from the store. So it's a great way to be able to do that. I hope that actually helps on that question. Our next one is hoping to learn how to roast perfect vegetables every time. So far, they're not liking the results with no oil roasting. Um, find a little browning, often a little dry, um, and no, what was that? No added roasted vegetable flavors you can get uh, with oil. So any suggestions? Yeah, so I actually did the broccoli in this one. It's a really simple technique that we, we show in a lot of our classes on how to do the no oil one. Um, but it does take a little practice and you have to keep your eye on it. Um, I, use, I usually like to use vegetable stock to add a little bit of moisture. So I'll check it about halfway through, add a little bit of moisture to it, uh, turn the pan around and put, put it back in. That way it's not going to get really dry, but I'm still going to get a nice little caramelization um, to be able to help that really great vegetable flavor come out because you do want that um, bit of brownness to be able to come out to really peak that vegetable flavor. So um, my best tip is, is uh, put a little bit of liquid on whatever vegetable you're, um, you're roasting um, and then check it about halfway through and put it in again. Um, you always want to check to see how the texture is as well to be able to get uh, the, the perfect roasted vegetables. So a little bit of practice, add a little bit of moisture. It doesn't have to be just vegetable stock. You can add all kinds of other things to it, sauces, um, to be able to get that perfect roast. But great question. Our next one, when you're doing meal planning and preparing for the week, how long will most cut up vegetables last? Will veg uh, which vegetables are best stored raw? roasted, blanched, parboiled, etc. And what is the best way to store them? So um, this is a very common question and I get this quite often. Um, and there is no easy answer to it because every vegetable um, is going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, if you're doing something like an apple, if you cut up the apple beforehand, you're going to get it brown, you know, um, pretty much hours right after you do it. Um, I typically will make my mise en place list of things that I'm going to store for the week, uh, kind of heartier vegetables, you know. Um, I'll also do like my no oil caramelized onions and I'll put them in my mise en place too. Um, but I'll typically do my onions, my shallots, uh, mushrooms. I'll cook off my chickpeas and cook off the rice and kind of keep those as well. The snap peas, I'll actually keep raw and then just use those, um, you know, blanch them as I need them to be able to go. Same with things like asparagus. So if you think about it, the heartier the vegetable, um, a lot of times it uh, holds up a little bit longer. Now, after you cut them up, um, I typically try to keep within a five to seven day range on any vegetables I'm going to be using for my mise en place um, because I really just want to make sure that I'm getting them just as fresh, you know, um, and part of that is experimentation. So, you know, like I said, just try one or two dishes per week. Try out some of your mise en place as well. If something looks like it's kind of getting a little close to it, what I personally do is I'll make a big soup or a stir fry using that mise en place to be able to get um, the most flavor out of those at the time. So um, I wish I could give you a firm answer, but uh, the, the real answer is it's really different for every single one of those um, vegetables um, as you're prepping them ahead of time. So our next question is with the understanding that a person should have so many grams of protein, calcium, and all the vitamins and so forth, is it possible to structure meal plans to whether you can measure or evaluate the daily intake was met? You know, um, I'm... I'm gonna, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm sure that there is um, by, you know, doing different, I'm sure that there are apps on that and, um, you know, there are possible ways, but I'm not, not the best person to answer that question. Um, you can also uh, email us um, at Ruby to be able to see if they might have other suggestions for that. Um, and I'll make a note, uh, Peggy, and I'll look for, um, you know, a way to be able to answer that in the future and try to get back with you. Cause that's, that's a, um, you know, for people that are trying to do that, that's great. I personally don't do that. I have this, you know, a uh, theory of eating the rainbow to be able to get all your different nutrients, um, and mixing those up throughout the week and really kind of getting um, a lot of greens as kind of the base. Um, but I don't do it to an exact science for our family as well, but great question. And we'll get back to you on that one. Our next question is, my husband and I both work full time. Meals have to be easy and put together, planned in advance. Otherwise, we order in or eat out. 
You need a good pro approach to the lifestyle eating. Yeah, this is actually exactly why I did this uh, webinar to be able to show how easy it is to be able to do this. Um, the important part of this is planning ahead, you know, so um, even if you both uh, work full time, you, sh you typically have at least one day off or a couple hours to be able to do this. Um, for this one in particular, I had my groceries delivered um, to the door and brought them in and really started um, preparing them um, at, you know, as I went. I, I sectioned it off. I literally do. As soon as I get home from the grocery store or they're delivered, um, I'll put everything away in the freezer, everything in the pantry that needs to go away. Um, and then I'll get out a cutting board and start cutting everything up to make my mise en place and map out a system to be able to create success for the week. Um, and I, I make sure that I've planned those out, um, you know, day by day as well. So if I was making, you know, uh, for example, some of the dishes we did today, like say the manicotti, I would know that I was going to have that on Monday and I was going to freeze the second one for the following Tuesday or something. Um, and if I was going to do the carbonara, well, I'm not going to do the manicotti and the carbonara day after day. I'll put a day in between there and maybe I would do the... Uh, chana masala instead, you know, so um, kind of switching those up to be able to make sure you can really find out what day um, all your recipes are going to work for you. Um, and that really all comes down to planning. So plan it out ahead of time. Make sure to make your uh, shopping list to accompany the recipes so you know exactly how much to be able to buy so you're not overbuying for those as well. Great question there. So how would you address a situation where one person is plant-based and one eats meat and the two are under this under the age of seven? So that's a great, uh, great question. I have two kiddos myself um, and they do tend to eat different things. You know, I have one that loves Indian food and one that's just not a big fan of Indian food. Um, so this uh, technique that we're talking about is actually a great way to be able to address that as well, because if you're making things ahead of time, you can plate two different dishes just by heating them up really easily. And you can also kind of mix and match different things. So say if I was going to be doing an, um, an Indian set and I do that chana masala, I could also do something where I'm doing like a beans and rice for the other child. Um, or I, if you're eating meat, you could do something where you're, um, you know, marinating your meats ahead of time and then just cook them um you know the night of to be able to do that but um planning ahead to be able to make those different kind of changes at the last minute because i don't know about you but i also have the problem where i'll plate something and then the kids are like i'm just not into this today and i have to figure something else out but luckily i have an entire refrigerator full of all these different meals that i can be able to pick and really heat up really quick and be able to put out a different option so part of that is just Keeping that in mind, like what will, would one kid like and what would the other um, and make a couple different options for those, um, you know, through the week so you can pull them out in a hurry to be able to make it work. Great question. So our next one is I've been planning to, to pre-chop a lot of my veggies, but I'm afraid they'll go bad or squishy before I use them. Uh, you're simply putting them in plastic containers. Yeah, that's actually um, what I am. I'm putting just some plastic containers that are airtight on the lid. Um, and, you know, I'm cutting them up. And again, you know, you want to try to keep the harder vegetables for those things, you know, like those onions, mushrooms. Mushrooms aren't hard, but they last pretty well on those. Um, you know, you can do your carrots and things like that as well. So um, I will just put them in plastic like that um, and just pull them out to be able to use them um, as I need them as well, too. So thanks for that question. Um, let's see. So our next one is need help meal planning, not meal prepping. Um, how do you plan meals for the week without spending hours combining through recipe books and apps? That's a wonderful question as well. Um, so part of that is looking through, you know, I, what I did for this one in particular is I went through our recipes for uh, Ruby to be able to make sure that I had the, um, you know, everybody could follow all of these recipes on here. But it did take some time to be able to go through those, you know, either the books or the apps or websites to be able to um, make that work. So that's kind of part of this is um, planning ahead. But also think about some of the dishes that you're making now, right? So I don't want this to be completely brand new. This is not, you know, I didn't just invent meal prepping right now, right? So Take some of the meals that you're doing now and think about how you can break them down into simple things that you can plan ahead for. Um, 
And uh, part of that is doing a little bit of research to be able to see what um, meals that you like that could accompany some of the things you, you have. But uh, start with what you, where you are at the moment, right? Um, you don't have to swan dive into this. Um, start with, you know, if, you're, if your meals that your family or you enjoy very regularly, put those on your menu for the week. Um, they should be on there and um, start cycling them out. And you'll see that your menu, your own personal menu will start growing over time where it might seem like the first two weeks you're like didn't we just have this last week and it's like yeah well you did but you're getting into your flow to be able to see um how well you can make these dishes how quickly you can make them um, and your speed will go over time so as you saw in the video i ended up doing i think it was like 12 dishes or something like that so it went um pretty fast because i've you know i'm pretty used to being able to do them and i'm doing multiple dishes at one time um, so part of that meal planning is actually doing a, a little prep and just finding the dishes that you want to explore but only add maybe one or two to the set that you already currently have i hope that helped our next question so planning ahead presents me with a challenge because i want to be able um, to be inspired by what i see fresh and interesting at the market can this be incorporated into a week's planning i love that um you know i grew up in that same vein where you pick out the foods that are fresh at the moment and that is actually what you're going to be cooking with um so you know you definitely can do that and when i'm at the market i pick out what looks fresh for the day um, you know, and I use that in my meal prepping to be able to make that happen. And what I'll do is I have a list of menu items on my phone too. Um, so when I go to the grocery store, I might switch out a recipe if I see something like Romanesca is in season and it just looks wonderful, you know, and I'm like, well, I could, you know, do this instead of my broccoli dish instead, or, um, you know, you know, part of this is being a, uh, letting yourself be adaptable. There's no written rule for this. Um, you definitely have to be able to shift a little bit. So when you're seeing those fresh vegetables, I want you to be able to take that on and make sure that you're using um, the, the fresh vegetables that you're seeing at the moment because you're going to get the most flavor out of them. If it's in season, you're going to get tons of flavor. You're going to get more nutrients out of it as well, too. So, um, you know, definitely incorporate those fresh vegetables um, real um, so you can make that happen. So our next question here is, I'm a senior, uh, single senior and find almost all recipes are from four to ten people. Wow, that's big recipes. And leftovers uh, often don't freeze well for greens. Yep, you're right. And uh, anyway, a... Uh, Anyway, a calculator to cut down and increase recipes could be built in. Um, wow, that's a uh, calculator for those is a little um, hard. So I do this a lot for larger recipes for schools. So we'll have to explode like a recipe for four to like a hundred people, which is very different. Um, and calculators for those are always a little imprecise because they might be perfect on the amount of onion you need, they wouldn't be on, say, the spice, like cinnamon, right? So if you were going to put cinnamon into a dish for four people, you wouldn't multiply that by 100 for um, that to be able to make that happen. So um, unfortunately, it's a little bit of, you know, playing with the recipe to be able to make that happen. Um, four to 10 people, 10 people is a lot for a recipe to be able to make those. Um, you know, um, I'm glad you're enjoying our whole food plant-based cooking course. There's a, a, most of those in there should be four to six on those, but feel free to adapt a little bit too um, and make those. And, you know, your instructors can usually help you a little bit to be able to kind of pare down some of those recipes if you'd like. So as you're putting in some of your comments on those, um, feel free to say, how could I actually pare this recipe down? And we'll help you do that as well. Um, but part of that is experimenting a little bit and um, making, you know, the recipe work for you. I don't know how many of you actually noticed, but the, uh, what was it, the carbonara with, pes uh, with penne that I made for this, um, for this video, I actually didn't use the cashews. Um, typically, that was something that I used to do for years and years, but um, I have a family member who's allergic to cashews, so I replaced them with beans instead. Um, and it's great because you get a protein source out of that as well. Um, you can add the oil if you want to. Um, you know, I do a mix of some oil um, in some dishes and some are not. It depends on your eating preferences, if you want the oil or not, but I will add it into it so my kiddos get the fat and the protein that they need um, on a plant-based diet as well. So um, on that question, there isn't a calculator to be able to cut all those. It's like a general um, and it's experimenting a little bit. 
So our next re our next question here is I just found out that canned beans are actually beans that were cooked in a can. Obviously, this means beans are not as nutritious and probably toxic. Thoughts? That is depending on the brand of beans. Um, you know, I know a lot of brands that don't cook directly in the can. Typically, um, I'm always going to buy BPA-free lining um, on cans as well to be able to make sure that there's nothing that's leaking into the beans. Um, you know, typically uh, the BPA lining uh, starts to break down under more acidic content. So it's like tomatoes. So if I'm buying tomatoes, I'm always going to buy a BPA-free can um, of beans as well, uh, or a BPA-free can of tomatoes. Um, but if you have worries like that, you might want to cook them from scratch. So as you saw what I did with the chickpeas, um, I'll do a batch of beans every week and I'll usually switch them out. So I'll do chickpeas one week and maybe I'll make a hummus or a chana or something like that. And the next week I'll do pinto beans, um, you know, and I do those uh, dry as well um, just to make sure that I have a good variety and you can make a couple of those. So if you're worried about that and, um, you know, buying the canned beans, definitely do them dry. They're cheaper. Um, you know, you can, there are different techniques on doing those beans as well. You can just look them up to be able to see the different cooking times on them. And, uh, you know, that's probably my best advice for that as well, too. So let me look at my next question here. Um, can you comment on oven roasting vegetables by covering them in aquafaba? Uh, actually, I... I can't. Um, I have not heard of that technique before, but I'm sure somebody on our staff has. has. So um, if you email us in, um, we will be glad to answer that as well, too. Um, but I, um, it looks like, I mean, it sounds like it would work. Um, I just haven't heard that one as well. So our next question um, is, many mise en place items are going to be reheated when cooking the dish. Uh, there's a lot less flavor because of the reheating compared to cooking and serving the dish right away. Um, let me read that one more time. Hold on. I'm just having an issue with my mic. All right, so, um, all right, going to be reheated when you, you lose a lot of flavor because of the reheating compared to, yeah. So that depends on the dish as well. You know, so um, my personally, um, you know, so like the manicotti, I actually don't find that I'm losing any flavor on that at all when I'm reheating it the second time. Um, now, there are certain dishes with really fresh flavors that you probably will see a little bit of uh, dampening on the flavor, depending on what it is. Um, but you can also brighten up some of those dishes as you are bringing it out um, to reheat. Um, some of those things, you might want to add an ingredient kind of at the last minute. You might want to put maybe a little bit of lemon juice or maybe a little tomato sauce, depending on what the dish is. Um, but uh, just depending on what the dish is, um, you can enhance the flavor by putting just a couple key ingredients or spices or an acid in at the end to be able to get, uh, you know, a bigger pop of flavor at the end as well. Um, before any of these dishes, you know, if I'm taking them out of the fridge and reheating them for the family, I'm always going to taste them beforehand to be able to make any micro, um, you know, adjustments that I do at the very end. And I think that's a, an important part of cooking ahead. So that is a great question. Um, um, Part of that is just making those micro adjustments at the end as well. So uh, I said that I screw, I freeze my scraps um, for stock. I saw that you also use the onion skin. Can you share more? Yeah, so that is a technique I've used for years. You know, um, as we teach in our classes, there's definitely a great way to be able to make stock, uh, you know, just using your, like just really quality ingredients to be able to get the best flavor that you can out of your stock. Um, you know, doing the, ca the carrots and the celery and, um, you know, but I typically like to be able to do it. So just like one of our comments before, I don't like to waste um, any of the food that I have. So I will cut up any of the, um, the vegetables that I have and put them into a plastic bag after I'm done. Now I'm going to typically do this with um, onions and the onion skins, um, you know, on the outside. I'll do that with like the, the inside of peppers or the tops of peppers. I'll do it with the stems of mushrooms. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do it with things that are kind of in that area. I'll do it with the, the peelings from my carrots and I'll put all of that into a baggie and then keep it in my freezer and then keep adding to that throughout the week. Um, 
Now, what that does is I'm basically taking all my scraps and I can bring it up to a boil and then down to a simmer to be able to make my stock. Um, now, that's not going to make as uh, flavorful of a stock as you would if you're just putting your whole onions, your whole carrots and everything in there. But um, I like it because I'm minimizing the amount of scraps that I have that I'm throwing out. So um, that is a technique that I've been doing for years and years, um, and it's it's a great way to be able to do that. Now, I do want to warn you, you don't want to put things like garlic or garlic skins or, you know, really potent things like ginger or ginger, you know, skins at all. Those will completely take a stock in a different direction. But say you were making, I don't know, a mushroom stroganoff and you have a bunch of trimmings for mushrooms, you can make just a mushroom stock, you know, using just a little bit of onion and the mushrooms and use uh, like the shiitake broth that we have on our menu sets as well, too. So um, that's just a, a tip for that I do for each week to be able to um, not waste as much. So I'm not putting as much in my compost bin as well, too. So our next question is, I don't use plastic. Is there any other kind of storage? I've been buying glass storage, but I would love to find storage that I can stack up. Yes, you and I are in the same boat as that. I love the um, ones that I showed in this video because they stack. And because I do this technique, there's they fit so evenly in there, but I would love to use glass instead. Um, I have had glass in the past, but it took up so much room in our pantry or in our, uh, you know, in the cupboards that I had to abandon it. Um, and I still on the search for that um, and would love to be able to see, uh, you know, if, if there's an alternative for that. Um, it, it is okay to be able to keep it in the plastic um, for that, um, you, you know, but I understand what you mean. You know, uh, what, we, what we don't want to do is a lot of, uh, you don't want to put the hot items in the plastic because that's actually when you can release some of those chemicals. I specifically buy BPA-free um, containers to be able to put things in, but I still let the dishes cool down before I put them into my plastic containers. But, um, you know, if you can find glass stackable containers, I would love to hear it. Or if anybody on this webinar, please email me at dan at ruby.com and uh, we'll share those out as well. Um, there was a question on this too about what size the Tupperware um, or the plastic container containers were, were they a pint? They were, I would say, about eight inches, uh, you know, across four inches, and then about three inches deep. Um, I'm not sure if that would be a pint. I haven't weighed them out at all. Um, I honestly, they're like a bulk container that you would get from like a restaurant supply or something like that as well. But, um, you know, whatever containers like that work for you is best. Um, you know, affordability wise, um, glass, if you can find glass that would work for that, it'd be wonderful. And I wish, like I said, I wish I could. Um, but these plastic ones work for me at the moment. Um, and you'll see that there are certain dishes I've got to separate into two different ones or like my beans or my rice. I'll typically have to put in bigger containers because if I'm making rice for the week, I'm going to have to have a larger container for that um, just to be able to fit the entire thing for that. But that's a great question. And I would love the glass, but we uh, unfortunately do have to do the plastic at the moment too. Um, Yep. So, oh, here's a comment saying that glass snapware is perfect for glass storage. It stacks beautifully. So thanks, Darlene. I am definitely going to, to look that up as soon as this is over to be able to see um, what that is and how I can get some myself because I love that. Um, and what brand or size are the containers? So I told you about the size, the brand. Uh, it says I could, I'm not 100% sure on that, but um, we might be able to make a post on that later. Um but yeah, I don't have a brand specific on that. We literally just bought, I think it was like a hundred of them at one time and then shared them with friends um, to be able to get like a wholesale price or something like that. So it's, it's not a brand name that's specific. It's from a restaurant supply store, but um, I can look that up um, if you email me about that again, Sandra. So our next question. I'm cooking for two, my husband and myself, he's not a vegan and I'm new at it. And I'm working, I'm a working person and need to figure out how to plan a vegan prep and a, oh, I just missed that, a vegan prep um, and ahead of time. Yeah, so that is a common question with people that have just started the plant-based journey is that maybe their spouse or some other family members um, have not uh, joined them on that journey. So um, you know, part of that is coming up with meals that you can switch the protein on, right? So, um, like I was, uh, for what I prepped for this was the carbonara with penne, you know, so I put, uh, a smoked 
tempeh in there instead of the smoked tofu um, as my protein source. You know, so um, that is something that, um, you know, you can do ahead of time. So I'll have the the tempeh bacon, you know, on the side and then the actual bacon on the side. Um, and then at your final touch as you're cooking up the sauce um, and you plate it, you can plate each one with one with the plant based source and one with the meat source. So um, part of that is, you know, having to plan ahead just a little bit. Um, to be able to figure out how you're going to do it. And I'm not sure if you're cooking the meat as well or if he's cooking the meat, but um, part of that is just figuring out what protein can kind of switch for each other, which can you switch out. So if it's uh, the tempeh bacon versus the regular bacon, um, you know, that's those are things that you can typically switch out at the end. Like if you're doing something like a beef bourguignon, like that's not going to work as well, right? Because um, you can't just switch out the beef at the end. That's a slow roasting process. Um, whereas your mushroom bourguignon would be a completely different thing. Could you do those at the same time? Yeah, you could. That's actually a nice thing where it's, if you're prepping, you know, your onions and your carrots for a uh, beef bourguignon and a mushroom bourguignon, you can prep all those things together, put them in two different pots, and then, you know, braise your meat or braise your mushrooms, depending on, um, you know, how that works. But it's it takes a little bit of juggling to be able to make that happen too so um so yeah the part of that is just uh switching up a little bit to be able to get the proteins to work for the diet that you're on so is there a sample menu that you can weekly menu that you can share so uh, right under here, the event document, there's a PDF of just the menu for the week that um, I, I did for this class in particular. Um, that one is just literally me kind of coming up with ones that when I was searching through the recipe lists for Ruby, um, you know, it's a great resource to be able to have. So typically when you're signed in at the top, you can go to recipes and there's like 20 pages of recipes that you can go through. And the nice thing is you can filter them depending on what you want, right? So if you want to plant-based one versus um, if you want the plant-based versus, you know, something that has meat in it, or if you want it to be vegan and or vegetarian, they're great filters to be able to go through um, and make that work. So um, all of those options are listed in that document. So there's a couple questions saying, do you have that on the website? Yeah. So all of the, that document, it actually has the recipes and hyperlinks. So if you click on them, they will go directly to the recipes on the page. So feel free to take that and, um, you know, do what you want with it and switch it out just because that worked for my family doesn't mean you are going to enjoy all those flavor profiles. And this is, you know, um, I did that last week. This coming week is going to be completely different than this uh, menu set. But there will be some standards in there, you know, like I'm always going to do like my overnight oats or my baked tofu. Um, I'm always going to do, you know, uh, a, a bean and uh, a rice, you know, to be able to kind of switch those as well, too. So um, those recipes are listed on that event document as well. All right. So our next question here is, that my husband and I are eating a plant-based diet. He has gut issues that prevent him from eating more than a tiny amount, like about a quarter of a cup of greens. And I end up adapting recipes because of this. Um, and for some reason, he cannot deal with lentils. Help. Yeah, that's something I've heard uh, quite a bit. And I do have to say, like, I'm a chef, I'm not a doctor. So um, you definitely want to consult your doctor before, um, you know, kind of making any big changes like that as well. But it sounds like what that is, is kind of the insoluble fibers versus soluble fibers. Um, and again, consult your doctor on this as well. But typically, those insoluble fibers are like greens. And you want to look for more of the, the solubles, like, um, like starchy tubers or like, you know, beets, plantains, carrots, winter squash, kind of things like that as well, to be able to stay on your plant-based diet. Um, there are different conditions and different medications where eating greens is not always the best. Um, but again, part of that is talking to um, an expert in that specifically, because I'm a chef. Um, I legally can't tell you to eat this way or to eat that way. But if you talk to a registered dietitian um, or a nutritionist, through your doctor's um, office, they would be able to help a little bit more specifically on the specific condition. But that sounds like it might be an insoluble fiber versus soluble fiber question to me. But I'm going to leave it at that to, um, you know, kind of do a little bit of research into those two things and talk to your doctor on it as well. Um, all right. So let's see our next question. Uh, 
do prepared foods that we reheat cause or cause a lot of loss of nutrients? Um, you know, that is debatable. Um, it's kind of been back and forth. You know, I've, a lot of people do a raw food diet because they say that they get a lot more nutrients out of their food when they're actually eating raw foods. But when you cook them, you're losing them. Again, that actually depends on the vegetable, right? So carrots actually have a certain nutrient product that, or nutrients that come out when you cook them. Um, but they also lose some that would come out um, when they're raw as well. So it's a little bit different in each one. Um, you know, as far as the techniques that I showed you now where I'm just cooking them and then we're reheating them a bit, it should be fine as long as you're not cooking them to death, you know? So like um, I always talk about, you know, collards in the South, you know, when I do my collard greens, when I'm cooking them and prepping them like this, I put them in for like seconds, um, you know, and I'll make sure that they're brighter than when I actually started out and then I'll let them cool and store them away. Now, when I put them to go reheat again, um, I'm going to, again, just make sure that they're really hot. Like I don't personally use microwaves um, just because it's hard to be able to control and see the heat on them. So, um, you know, I typically would just kind of put them in to be able to make them do. And honestly, for collards, it's probably not the best example because I usually do those fresh right away. But something like um, like a chana masala, like in this one, or if I were to do a sog paneer, um, it's it's okay to be able to reheat those a little bit. You are going to be losing a little bit of nutrient, but not enough where you have to worry about you know prepping ahead. And quite honestly, if you know you're making these dishes ahead, like it's it could be the choice between having to order out and or eating something that you know is nutritious. You know all the ingredients in, so you know it's it's kind of measuring it out to be able to see what works best for you, right? So. If, um, if it's making you eat at home and you're eating great food that's plant-based, I would always choose that option versus something that you would get, you know, order delivery or something like that to be able to make that happen. So the small amount of nutrients that you're losing pretty, um, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't worry about them compared to getting like a delivery or something like that. Um, how long do you let your food cool before putting into your dishes and ultimately in the fridge? Are you concerned about bacteria um, being left out too long? So, uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. We have an entire safety class on that that I would recommend going into it as well. I typically am going to let them cool down to room temperature. Um, if you can do it where, you know, a lot of commercial kitchens will cool down things quicker um, to be able to make that happen. If I have something that's piping hot, I might put it into a glass container and then put it in the fridge or the freezer to cool it down really, really quickly. Um, you know, that can be a concern if you have things that are out um, having bacteria, if you left it out too long. So you definitely want to um, refer to um, some of those safety guidelines on that to be able to make sure. Now, I personally am going to let them cool down to that room temperature before putting them into um, my containers, but definitely refer to, um, you know, some of the things that we've learned through the class on those. Um, you know, I'm not going to leave them out for like more than an hour. Definitely not. Um, but, you know, about 30 minutes or so to be able to get it to cool down is definitely kind of that um, magic place for me. But if it's something that's piping hot, I'll put it in something that can be you know, expose like the glass um, and then put it into the fridge or the freezer to be able to help cool it down. And um, commercial kitchens, they call those blast coolers, but nobody has at home. So we have to be able to use what we want, typically a freezer um, or the fridge to be able to get that down. Um, what is the best way to store lettuce to keep it crisp? That's a great question. Um, I typically leave, you know, I'll leave it in um, like a damp cloth or a paper towel. Usually it's a cloth just to be able to be a little more conscious of that, but I'll keep it um, just in a little bit of damp cloth to be able to keep the the inside crisp as well. I've heard you can put it in water as well to be able to kind of help the growth of it and it'll keep it crisp as well. Um, but those are typically not things I'm going to prepare like, you know, a whole week in advance. Like you'll notice I didn't make any of my salads for this dish as well because um, I'll keep those in their containers that they came in or wrap them or wash them and wrap them in a towel to be able to make sure that um, they're as fresh as possible. Because if I picked all those lettuce or chopped up all that lettuce at a time, it's going to be way wilted by the time I need it if it's five days later. So, um, you know, wrapping it in a towel, putting it in water, um, you know, keeping it in the package that it came in to be able to start with and doing that the night of. And that's, you know, a lot of the mise en place that I do, that's to be able to do nice salads um, the day of, so I can make all that fresh the day of as well too. So, 
How many, our next question is how many hours should we expect to spend prepping for a family of four or a week's worth of meals? That's a great question. And it really depends on how much you're going to do. So um, this was just by quick count, like 14 different dishes, but some of those are side dishes, you know, um, and some of them are different meals. And this took me about three and a half hours to do all of those. But you do have to consider that I've been doing these for a while. Um, so if you're doing, you know, an entire family of four for an entire week, you might want to, and you're prepping every single dish, I would say four to five hours if you're doing every single one. But again, I would reiterate, don't start with that, right? So um, start with doing four nights of the week, you know, and maybe a couple lunches that can cross over. And then use four of those uh, dinner meals that you can use for a leftover one of the other nights as well to be able to make it so you can double up what you're using to be able to have it for other things um, throughout the week as well. Um, the other thing I want to say is mise en place is a great thing to be able to do. So if I don't have the time, like the three and a half to five hours to be able to prep everything on that Sunday when I get home from the grocery store, I'm at least going to spend an hour doing mise en place to be able to set it up. Because then when I get home from work, I can throw everything in real fresh and make it right on the spot. So if I'm going to do um, like a white sauce pasta or something like that. I can just get all my ingredients starting to saute, get my water boiling and my pasta going and just kind of, you know, take all that out, all, all the, uh, the chopping and stuff ahead of time out of the equation to be able to make it happen. So um, start by just doing a couple dishes and then do the mise en place for the week to be able to make that happen. And then you'll, instead of doing like four hours or five hours, you can do this in a much shorter amount of time um, and just do it in an hour or two on that day that you have it. And, you know, I get it. Families are busy. So sometimes you might have to split it up to be able to do this and like say, okay, I've got an hour just to do my mise en place. And I'm going to put my mise en place away. And then I'll start some of my meal prepping, you know, an hour or two later, because things happen with families where you get pulled away and that's completely understandable. Um, just make sure that you're, um, you know, taking it easy on yourself, that you're planning out ahead of time and looking for the best way to be able to make it um, uh, not, you know, take all the time out of your entire week. And I do understand that's a lot of time on one day to be able to do this, but you're taking that time out of the week to make your week flow much easier um, throughout the week. And that's, that's the way I've done it for years to be able to make sure that I have the time and the restfulness when I only have 15 minutes when I get home from work to be able to make these. Um, so it just works really, really well for me. Um, all right. So I'm glad you enjoyed it, Terry. So how do we store food after cooking it up to a week? Does it not go bad? So, uh, that again, you want to keep it in in your refrigerator, um, you know, or freezer, depending on what you're doing. Um, keeping it in plastic or glass, um, you know, is typically what I'll do. I'll do the plastic, but as we saw from just earlier in this, um, the glass is a great option if you can do that as well. And depending on the dish um, is really, um, you know, uh, that you're making, you want to keep, keep that, um, you know, in, in mind for that. So for tofu sandwiches, what do you put on it besides tofu and bread? That depends on the day. Honestly, that's something that, um, you know, my wife and I have pretty often is either a tofu wrap or a sandwich. Um, and it depends on what we're in the mood for for the day. You know, uh, like kind of a go to for me is like a like a stone ground mustard and maybe some of the pickled onions that I showed how to um, uh, on this one as well. Um, and I'll do some lettuce, uh, you know, we might do pickles. My daughter's a big fan of pickles. So if we're making her a tofu sandwich, it's got to have some pickles on it. Um, you know, but again, kind of mix and match to be able to do that. Like that's just kind of a traditional one that I do. But, um, you know, if we're feeling a little bit spicy or like maybe I made a pad thai and I have a peanut sauce, maybe I'll put some peanut sauce in the tofu into a wrap and um, maybe put if I prep some like mung bean sprouts or something like that, I can throw those into it as well. Um, but I that's one of the great things about just, 
you know, making the tofu like that in advance is you can mix and match that any way you want to. Um, for our youngest one who doesn't do sandwiches, she's not able to hold them yet. I'll just take the tofu and slice it up for her to be able to um, eat just as it is like that or put, give her a dip or something to be able to dip it in to be able to make that work for her. So, um, you know, that's a really diverse way to be able to use them. But for your whatever kind of sandwich you like, uh, switch it up um, and think about different ways. Uh, tomato is another thing I like to put on those as well too. But again, you know, switching those up to be able to make it work for you. What methods do you use for washing produce before you prep? That's a great question and that's a long list too. So um, I typically am going to um, fill up my sink on one side of my sink um, with just a little bit of water and splash just a little bit of vinegar into that. Um, some people will do like there's, I don't know, some kind of things you can buy to be able to put it, but I'll either do a vinegar or an organic soap and just a very small amount of soap to be able to put into that as well. Um, and that is typically what I'll do to wash my, my, uh, my produce beforehand. And again, I'm not gonna do that to the greens. I'm typically gonna do that the day of um, that I'm actually using it, but all the rest of it, I'm gonna wash ahead of time and then put out on a uh, towel on my countertops. Um, and then start using it from there. So that's a great question. Um, all right, so what is in the vegetable stock? What is the ratio of vegetables to water? Uh, so every week is different because it depends on what I'm prepping um, in that stock. There is a wonderful uh, clear stock recipe on Ruby um, that you can either make into a cabbage or a pho, but you can also just keep the standard stock itself. That stock is superb, and I would definitely recommend using that if you're looking for exact ratios for vegetables to water and that stuff like that and the exact uh, recipe. For mine, it's always going to be onion scraps, mushroom scraps, and pepper scraps. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. I might put like zucchini or some, you know, some other things in there too, but I'm literally only doing that so I don't throw those scraps away um, and I get a different flavor out of it kind of every time I do it. Um, the water amount is when I empty my, you know, baggie into my big stock pot, I'm going to just cover um, the vegetables with water. Once I get it just covered, that's basically it, you know, so if you're looking for a recipe that couldn't be any easier just dump your vegetables in just slightly cover it water bring it to a boil and then down to a simmer and you're done it's um, well i usually cook it for at least an hour before i go and you'll see just with the same stock that we do on ruby look for that deep color that comes out of that as well too all right so next question is do you make an electronic document for each week write it in a log book or how do you document your weekly menu um, I actually do it, um, you know, I do it on my iPhone, on the notes category, and I share the note with my wife. So we both can be on the same page. And when we make a change to the menu, um, we both know about it. So if for some reason she's like, you know what, we just did, um, I don't know, the potato and leek soup last week. You know, one of our kids wasn't into it and I didn't like it that much. Let's switch it up. She'll take it off the menu. And then when she updates the note, it tells me, it's like, okay, I got to come up with a different soup or maybe she puts a different soup in there. And then the important thing is after you make the changes for that, um, we actually will have uh, to put out the ingredients on that as well. And um, what we'll do is when we, we just put menu titles on things and then we have this running list of different menu titles and then we put a check mark by it to be able to see that's what we want to do for this week. Um, now, I think in that document that we share between each other, there's, I don't know, there's probably like maybe 80 different recipes, you know, and, um, you know, each one of them, we have to be able to go through each week to be able to put the ingredients on. But um, if it's a pad and paper, if it's a, a book, you know, a recipe book that you use yourself, that's great. The important thing is to be able to um, just have a place where you can document what menu you're going to do. And then, piece it out to be able to get the ingredients that you need to order ahead of time. And then look to see what needs to be made ahead of time, what you can store and what your reason plus is going to be. But that's a great question. I'm sure on, you know, other phones like Androids and stuff like that, there are other kind of note, um, you know, options like that. Um, and I know on computers there are too, but a notepad would be just, um, just as good. So I think that's a great thing to be able to do. 
Our next question is, I read that cut greens do not keep well when they're washed and cut. You are correct. Yeah, um, that typically, I don't cut my greens ahead of time, um, you know, or wash them ahead of time. I'll typically keep them in the container that they either came from. Um, if I am going to be doing a salad I prep ahead of time, I'll wrap it in a towel, a damp towel. And I, that might have been not as clear, but typically I'll do that with like romaine, right? So, um, but typically I'm going to wash those uh, the day I'm going to be using them or take them out of the container the day of. All right, so our next question is, um, my daughter is a pediatrician and plant-based. She tries to help kids with health issues. Do you have any suggestions on kid-friendly plant pe meals? It's pro pe protein-based, which is always a concern for parents uh, when they hear plant-based diet. Yeah, that's... Uh, you know, very true. And I've talked to a lot of different pediatricians um, on this and some of them that actually work, uh, you know, with Ruby and um, done some great things. And one of the big things that you're always concerned uh, if your kids are plant-based is that you're getting enough protein and fat to be able to be growing. You know, as adults, it's that running joke if you're plant-based, it was like, where are you getting your protein? For kids, we need to pay a lot more attention to it. So I will typically do dishes for them that are going to be a little more protein and fat forward. Um, it's actually, you know, a lot of the meals that I make for myself and my wife, I do no oil, but I do add oil for the kid ones, depending on what the oil is. Um, and that's a personal preference too. You know, that's just what I do. But, you know, uh, the the chickpea um, tuna salad is one of my daughter's favorites. She loves that and she'll just eat spoonfuls and spoonfuls of that stuff. But it's great because it's got um, the chickpea for the protein and it's got either the mayo or the cashew um, sour cream. She can't do the cashew. So uh, we do the mayo, but that has the fat that she's looking for as well. The tofu, um, you know, baked tofu things are great things to do with those as well. Um you know, the, they love the tofu scramble as well, but, um, you know, a lot of things like the pastas, you know, I'll actually add beans, typically cannellini beans to pastas to be able to make sure that they're getting those protein sources in there too. So, um, depending on their health issues, you know, the pediatrician is definitely the person you would consult. Um, the ideas that I'm giving you are just kind of generally what I do with my family, um, to be able to make sure that they're getting uh, a lot of the nutrients that I want them to get. Um, but you know, definitely consult with the pediatrician to be able to do that. And if your daughter's a pediatrician, she might be steered in the right um, way to be able to do those. You know, uh, Plantrition is an, an organization that has a couple uh, plant-based pediatricians. That is a great, they have a great guide for parents and pediatricians to be able to help on those. And we do have a class on Ruby specifically um, that caters towards doctors. So she might, um, you might suggest that she take one of the classes um, you know, as a pediatrician can really help to be able to make some of those as well. Our next one is, uh, do different variety of mushrooms work better in different dishes? And also how can you tell when it's cooked through? So yeah, that actually, it, it does, you know, so I will use different mushrooms in all kinds of different dishes, you know, so um, if I'm doing something like a stir fry, I would more likely use like a shiitake mushroom that has more of a kind of a woody, earthy kind of a feel. If I'm doing something like that carbonara or a pesto, um, you know, with pasta, I'm typically going to use a white or a button mushroom, you know. Um, and that's just a flavor, you know, profile. It's a little different. I'm typically not going to use a portobello unless I'm looking for a super meaty flavor. Um, and if I'm looking for something that just has like an over, you know, really great kind of wild mushroom mix, but I can't get wild mushrooms, I might use all three of those. Um, you know, I'm based in Austin, Texas, so we do get mushrooms here. But like if you were in like Portland, you get tons and tons of mushroom varieties that I just can't get get is easy here. So I would definitely experiment with those a bit to be able to see which flavor profiles you like best. Um, and depending on, you know, when, how can you tell when it's cooked through, that just depends on the mushroom as well. Um, you know, you can cook them till they release their water and you can get a nice, um, you know, sear on them as well, but it depends on the dish that you're doing for those as well too. Our next one is how do I make uh, crispy chips with no oil? So crispy chips, I'm guessing you're probably saying something like out of potato or sweet potato, but you could also do it with kale as well. Um, you know, those are a favorite in our family as well. Um, I will typically, um, you know, 
take let's take the potato for example i'll just use a sheet pan um, put my oven to about 375 350 degrees um, slice the, the potatoes put them in the liquid that i want to season them with usually i use a vegetable stock um, i don't typically it's kind of a crazy thing i don't salt many things um, i'm not a huge fan of salting things before you plate them if people want salt they can add salt to them and luckily my kids don't have a salt container on their um, table. But if you want to add to it, you can. But anyway, so I'll take that uh, vegetable stock or whatever, um, you know, it might be chipotle or some other seasoning, garlic uh, powder. Um, let them soak in that just for a little bit, then put the slices out on the, um, the sheet pan. Now I'll let them cook for a bit. And I typically always just kind of standard put it on 20 minutes and then when i take them out um they're going to stick to the pan a little bit and what i do is i take like a metal spatula and i'll put them underneath to be able to scrape to make sure that i get that caramelization stuck to the bottom of that potato or um, or whatever it is i'm actually doing for those chips um you know and for like kale chips would be different that's like i usually use a dehydrator for that but for a potato or sweet potato chip that's typically what i'm going to do is put them in the liquid for that let that caramelization form and put it underneath if i don't have any caramelization on top i'll flip them over add a little bit liquid so they don't dry out completely until i'm ready to be able to take them out now if i'm doing something like a kale chip i'll typically take something like the the um I don't know, the white sauce or something like the cashew thing, like, um, and put different things that you would, um, you know, maybe the ingredients you'd find in like a ranch dressing minus all the, the dairy and stuff, but all the other herbs, and then mix that in with that cashew, squish all the um, kale together and put it in the hydrator. Um, you can also just put them in your oven at the lowest temperature, or sometimes people say you can just put them on a pilot light. Um, but I'll typically kind of keep it, um, you know, pretty simple with that on the dehydrator and make sure that it is, um, you know, really trying to make sure that you get the, the, the texture you're looking for as well. Can you talk a little bit about reheating? I usually use the microwave. The reheated food tends to be quite dry. So um, I have to tell you personally, I don't use a microwave. I don't own one. Um, so I don't use them too much. I have heard that they can dry some things out and it's debatable if it takes nutrients away. I don't want to get into that debate. I'm not a scientist in that area to be able to make sure you know how to do that. But for reheating, what I like to do is use a saute pan. I just keep it very simple and um, I'll use the saute pan and uh, I'll put the dish directly into the saute pan. If it has oil in it, I might put a little bit of spray oil on the bottom. I'm not a big fan of using a lot of oil um, depending on the dish. If it calls for, I'll put oil in and maybe wipe the inside of the pan down. I didn't do that on one of the dishes here and looked at it and was like, I can't believe I forgot that, but I might just put oil in and then wipe it down to the paper towel or a towel to be able to get the excess out. So I'm just creating a non-stick surface is really what I'm looking for. Um, I know in a lot of the no oil classes, we um, you know recommend a steel pan. Um, I do a mix. I'll do steel or non-stick pans. A lot of people don't like non-stick because a residue can come off. If I start seeing scrapes on the bottom of my non-stick pan, I get rid of the pan. Um, I don't buy super expensive pans um, for my non-stick ones. I do for my steel ones because they last forever. Um, but you can also use, um, you know, like the, um, I can't even think of it, like the lodge style pans. I have my great grandmother's and it's not a lodge, but um, those kinds of things that are pre-seasoned as well too. So um, I love to be able to do that. And if it's a little bit dry, add a little bit of vegetable stock or something to it. It's a great way to be able to add a lot of moisture to those too. Have you ever used the air fryer function in the Instapot to make crispy tofu? I personally have not. I've got friends that have done that and they said it worked. I've only used an air fryer one time at my um, in-laws. I did it to do buffalo cauliflower and it worked great. Um, I was surprised by it. I honestly just had too many gadgets in my kitchen already to buy one more um, you know, thing. So I typically am not using an Instapot or an air fryer. As awesome as I hear that they are, I personally don't have them. Um, on those as well too. So uh, having a question about cheese is not part of the healthy plant diets. Um, you're correct, this is a plant-based class. Oh, you're probably referring to the manicotti. So the manicotti was actually a tofu manicotti or the uh, ricotta that's on the inside of the um, 
on the inside of the manicotti and that's actually tofu so that's not cheese um and that's definitely you know something that we're not bringing into this course uh, or my courses at all that i work with and i don't bring them into my home either um we're doing a tofu um tofu ricotta with that i guess that's i'm guessing that's what you're referring to because nothing on my menu that i ever make has cheese in it so um hope that helps with that one oh here's another one on jars so glass uh containers uh weckjars.com uh I'm not, I've never heard of them, but that's what somebody's saying is wickjars.com for glass containers. That's a great, I typically would use, oh, here's a bunch of them. So there's also one saying, uh, one by Snapware, Pyrex glass containers. I used to have the Pyrex. Unfortunately, those don't, um, you know, seal together as well for me. As you saw, the manicotti that I put in there actually was one of those Pyrex with those great lids on them. So I do still have them. I just have to keep them in a different place, uh, you know, instead of in my pantries, which is a bummer. Um, and they do stack. They just, you know, they're a little taller for me. So just kind of depends on what works for you as well. I'll also use like, you know, mason or bell jars, stuff like that as well too, or ball jars. Um, all of those things are um, great to be able to do too, to be able to switch those up. Um, you can line the plastic with parchment, which is like Shara. Oh, hey, Shara, that is a great comment. So um, you can line the plastic with parchment um, to be able to make sure that nothing's leaking into it. That's a wonderful way to be able to do that. Thanks, Shara, she's one of our instructors here as well. Um, that's a great idea to be able to put the, the, the parchment, just kind of line it down into the plastic um, so you're not leaching any of the, the chemicals into those as well too. Does plant-based only mean vegan? Um, well, it depends on who you talk to. Typically, the way we kind of look at plant-based versus vegan um, is that, you know, a vegan diet is eliminating all animal products, including dairy, meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and honey. So anything that comes from an animal at all. So, you know, people follow vegan diets for all kinds of different reasons, if it's environmental or health, um, you know, all kinds of different things. In a plant-based diet, there's uh, a little more flexibility. We typically at Ruby like to say plant-based diet is the, you know, kind of synonymous in that, um, that vegan category as well. Um, but plant-based products, um, you know, are, uh, they don't really contain any animal products as well. Now, if you're on a plant-based diet, some people might say that they are on a plant-based diet, but I still consume, I don't know, butter, you know, something like that. Um, and that's, that wouldn't be a non-vegan butter, you know. Um, and part of that is um, that's their choice. You know, if they want to um, have that as part of, you know, I, I was a vegetarian for like 21 years before I became vegan, um, you know, and part of that is like a lot of people call themselves vegetarian, but they still eat fish. And I'm like, well that's kind of a vegetarian, you're a pescatarian, right? So there are a lot of different categories to be able to put these things into. Vegan definitely is um, no animal product whatsoever. Plant-based has a little more leniency to it. I personally like to say when you're plant-based, you're not eating any animals at all, you're eating plants, right? So, um, but there might be a little bit more leniency in areas like honey or something like that as well. Um, but, you know, we're very inclusive. So we like to be able to say, um, you know, when we're talking about um, plant-based, we're trying to keep it, uh, you know, kind of open to interpretation of the students that are coming to us through the class. But um, yeah, so there are a lot, a couple different ways to be able to do that, but I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, all right, so excited. That's great to be on the online cooking course. Um, I love it. How's Great. That's wonderful. So um, husband's come recently on board with the whole food plant-based diet. Um, and I'm glad you like the class. Uh, a lot of different ideas out here to be able to do that. And, you know, there are, like we were kind of talking about uh, uh, earlier, you can go out in other places to be able to find some other inspiration for this too. Um, you know, going to the recipe uh, link um, on Ruby is wonderful. I love that to be able to go through, to be able to build menus, but, um, there are wonderful things on like Instagram and all kinds of other things out there, um, to be able to see, to get inspiration. And, you know, one of the things I always tell people is don't follow the book exactly. If you're baking or doing pastries and stuff like that, you need to follow the recipes exactly, but, um, change it up a little bit to be able to see what works for you. I think it's a, a wonderful way to be able to experiment with your food. So don't tell your parents, but you're allowed to play with your food from now on. 
All right. So new to whole food, plant-based, feeling overwhelmed. Hope this event clears up some concern. I hope it did too, Janine. Um, you know, this is, uh, again, this is what I did here is kind of a lot at one time. So just start with one or two of these items to be able to build up your menu list that you can be able to do week to week. Um, and I hope that um, this helped uh, for you as well. My uh, husband and I have been doing whole food plant-based diet for a year, but only 80% originally and during COVID closer to 50%. Uh, the big obstacle is meal planning and shopping. So this will be a good session for us to learn. So Carolyn, I hope it helped you. Um, you know, again, uh, there's some great things to be able to kind of start out with these and make it your own um, and, you know, adapt this to be able to make it work just for you. Uh, I'd love some tips for cooking for one person that eats a little, half portions, food usually spoils before I can finish it. Um, I prefer eating the same thing the whole week, whoops, uh, the whole week to save time and only cook on the weekend. So yeah, um, hopefully that this helped with you a little bit. Um, you can portion size out as you want. Now, um, you know, if it's just one person, I want you to look at these and be able to see, is, is this something I could eat also a couple times a week? Like when I was single and doing this, um, that's, that's a hurdle. I understand that cooking for a family of four is completely different than cooking for one person. Um, and what that meant was that I was doing, um, you know, I had to be able to kind of look ahead in the same way. So if I were going to, you know, make that uh, manicotti recipe, I would have the recipe myself and then I'd have that dish a couple times that week. Um, so, you know, the next week, I probably wouldn't make manicotti because I had it twice the week before. So um, kind of switching that up a little bit um, to be able to make sure that you're getting, uh, you know, a, a quality food. Um, so you're not wasting anything as well. Um, and then going through kind of meticulously at your menu planning to be able to see what can I do to be able to carry off into another day. Um, you know, if I'm doing something like maybe I made collard greens the night before, um, I'm probably, or I made collard greens for dinner. I'm going to maybe eat those collard greens the next day for lunch, just because I don't want those collard greens sitting in my fridge for seven days. They're not going to be as good by the end of it. But if it's something like the chana masala, I know that that's going to last those seven days easily. So, um, you know, I might have it on day one and day seven. Um, so I hope that helped for you as well. Um, all right. So I thought that the whole idea of Nutrition RX is cooking without oil. Yes, you are correct. Um, you know, that uh, for that class in particular, they do cook without oil. Um, for uh, a lot of other classes um, on Ruby, including the plant-based ones, we do use oil. Uh, that's a personal preference for each person that likes to do it. Um, I do, like I said, kind of a mix. Um, you know, I typically will cook without oil for most of the meals that my wife and I do and then cook with oil for some of the, um, uh, for some of the, uh, the dishes I do for my kids as well, but that's a personal preference. And some of you that aren't doing no oil, why is that an issue? Um, well, it's, it's, uh, oil is 120 calories per tablespoon, no matter what kind of oil it is, right? So it doesn't matter if it's avocado oil or if it's olive oil or coconut oil. Don't cook with 10W40, but even that would be 120 calories. But all of those being 120 calories can add a lot of um, calories to your dish before you even put anything in the pan, right? So uh, if I'm going to cook with oil, I'm typically going to put a little in and then wipe the dish down. I know I didn't on this, but I typically do. Um, but again, that's a personal preference on each one. But for your nutritional RX, yes, uh, no oil cooking is definitely a staple in um, that class. And you are correct. So is it recommended to wash your vegetable scraps before freezing and eventually adding to a pot with water to make stock? Or does the boiling process take care of any food safety concerns? That's a great question. I typically wash everything ahead of time to be with. So I'm washing all my vegetables, um, you know, and putting them out on a towel as I prep them. My onions, I'm typically going to rinse them off a little bit beforehand and then freeze them. And then the boiling process, you know, I guess it would take any of, um, get rid of any of those concerns as well too. So that's great. Are live events available for viewing it later? Yes, they are, Any So um, all of these uh, are listed later and not only just this one, but all of the other events that we've done, including a lot of great office hours you can go into to be able to see. So uh, wonderful things to be able to join in, to be able to see any of our past classes or this one again. So great pointers. Thanks, Lena. Um, 
what did you put in the stock pot? So again, that was my leftover vegetables um, and trimmings from the week. Um, you know, but each time, each week I do that, that's going to be a little bit different. If you're looking for a good stock recipe, I definitely recommend the Ruby clear stock recipe. It's a wonderful one to do. This one I just did out of the scraps from my onions, my peppers, my mushrooms, um, and some of the other vegetables I had from the week as well, too. Um, so thanks for sharing here. And can you advise any info appreciated on meal planning recipes for kids? So. Um, again, it's kind of, um, you know, I'll, I'll change this up a little bit, but I definitely do my favorites for them every single week. You know, uh, like I said, the chickpea tuna salad is one of those that I'll do almost every week. I typically try to not do it every week, but at least every other because it's my daughter's favorite, right? So, and I know it's a nutritious thing um, to be able to do into it. I'll also do, you know, the like pastas, like that carbonara. Oh, we do like I'll actually add frozen uh, spinach into it as well because some kids love greens on their own, but my kids don't. So I'm typically putting them in cooked, um, you know, so uh, like I'm going to make sure that I'm going to get all of the, all the nutrients I can to be able to get into those. And um, part of that is, um, you know, when you're meal planning for kids is make sure that you think about yourself, too. Like I am not a huge proponent of making completely separate dishes for the kids than what we're going to eat. I am most often like 80 to 90% of the time going to serve my children the same dish that my wife and I are having. Um, now, there might be some things that I would exclude from the meals that my wife and I are having, like spices, right? So a lot of times I'm not going to spice up the dish unless I'm serving it right away to um, my wife and I, and I'll keep the spiciness out of their stuff. They grew up in Texas, so they're getting a little used to spice. But again, that's a, a call for yourself as well, too. But, um, you know, so I'm typically going to do a lot of the dishes that are consistent with the ones that we're eating for dinner. But then I'll make a couple special things just for them in case of emergency. And they're like, you know what? I don't want this for dinner. I'm going to not eat or something like that, you know. And then I have those other dishes like the um, the, 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 the chickpea tuna salad. Um, or the tofu scrambles that I'll keep off to the side to be able to pull out at a moment's notice so I need them. So, thanks. So, oh, thank you so much, Cassandra, for your comment on uh, plant based eating in my skin. How do you email me? Um, my email address is dan at ruby.com. So, if you have questions, you can always email me at those. Um, and I'm, I'm typically pretty good about getting back to them. It might take me a little time depending on what day and what's going on, but you can always email me at dan at ruby.com. Uh, what texture tofu lasts the longest when taking a scramble and turning it into a cold dip? I'm not 100% sure what you're meaning by that question on that one. Sorry, um, I'll have to come back to it. So to uh, store the cut vegetables, do you need an airtight container or a regular container work? I like to use airtight containers. Mushrooms, I might leave a little give for them as well. Um, mushrooms like a little bit of air. Um, I don't typically cut my mushrooms up ahead of time. Sometimes I do, but I do let them air a little bit. Um, you know, if you just keep them in like the plastic bag that you get them at the grocery store, they typically wilt really quick or start to turn more brown than you want them to be able to do too. So um, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to figure that out. Elizabeth, if you don't mind emailing me on that question about the tofu uh, texture, I will gladly answer you. I just... I'm not un understanding it 100%, so we can go back and forth and I'll answer that individually. So for the tofu scramble uh, example you used, do you cook it in advance or do you simple crumble in and mix with the seasonings and cook on demand? Um, that's actually, I do that in advance. Um, I will uh, typically have a container of that in my um, fridge just for breakfast. You know, we'll do overnight oats one day and then maybe tofu scramble tacos the next. Um, and I do that so I can just quickly heat it up in the morning. Um, you know, if you've got kids, you know that sometimes the mornings are not the best times. So, um, you know, I'll cook that all ahead of time um, and season it and everything. Um, so just, uh, you know, I'll cook it in, in advance and then just heat it up in the saute pan while I'm heating up my tortillas as well. So great. Thanks for joining us today, Robert um, and Michelle. 
All right. Here's another question is, uh, husband and I are now almost a hundred percent whole food plant-based since May. Congratulations. We find it easy and enjoyable to eat. Um, the transition was highly motivated by, um, his rare GI cancer diagnosis. I'm sorry to hear about that, but I'm hope, hoping that the plant-based diet's helping. Um, they said that we need some more recipes for our, that being said, we need more recipes for a repertoire. Well, that's great because Ruby has hundreds of recipes for you to be able to jump into. Um, again, I highly recommend going to the tab when you log in um, you know, on your regular Ruby screen, you'll see that there is a recipe tab and you can, um, you know, Pick, there's great filters so you can actually go through and pick if it's a plant-based meal um, or vegetarian or whatever to be able to make that happen. So um, definitely, you know, look through those. We have a lot of great partners too, like Forks Over Knives, who have huge amounts of recipe sets. So um, definitely check out some of their websites as well too. And, you know, you can always go back to the classes that you've already taken and look at some of the other recipes, you know. So if you did one of the recipes like the, the stock example, right? So there's a faux stock and then there's the cabbage soup stock. Well, maybe you did the, the, the cabbage soup recipe for your grade, but you didn't do the faux stock. Go back and do the faux stock, you know? So that's a great thing, or the faux, sorry. Um, but the do the other um, stock to be able to, um, you know, experiment with those. And there's a lot of those recipes that you already have built into your courses. So definitely check those other ones out that you didn't do before as well. All right, so my husband had kidney stones, so we need to avoid uh, oxalates and nuts, um, as well as broth, raw dairies, sensitive, so we need to avoid this. How can recipes be translated to fix this? So it looks like you're trying to avoid a couple different ingredients here, being nuts, raw dairy, um, and those are both things that are kind of simple to switch out. Now, again, I'm I'm not a doctor, I'm a chef, so um, I'm not 100% sure where I can lead you down on that, but as far as substitutions, I can help. And, you know, for like the things like nuts, like for cashews, like when we're, we did that carbonara, um, you know, cashews is what's written in the recipe, but I do white beans instead because our family has a sensitivity to cashews. Um, you know, as far as the dairy goes, there's so many alternatives for dairy nowadays. Um, I mean, just tons and tons and tons. Uh, so I would definitely do a little bit of research to be able to find out what you can do for your uh, sensitivity. Because, you know, as far as dairy goes, just the, the liquid milks from oat milks to almond milks to um, there's a ton of variety. And then in the cheese category, there's tons of different vegan cheeses out there um, and plant-based cheeses and all kinds of ones to do with that. There are also plant-based butters for those too. So um, definitely look down that path a little bit and you'll find some of those. As far as um, switching out, if you have some specific recipes you're looking to be able to switch out, um, email us and we'll try to help you with those as well too. The question on nutrient calculation, you might find this helpful, this app, or might find Eat This Much app helpful. So thanks, Elena. There was somebody earlier that was asking about specific nutrient calculation. I didn't know the answer to it, but it seems like uh, Helona does. So Eat This Much app, uh, I don't. I can't recommend it. I've never seen it or heard of it, but um, Helona recommends it. So I love the Idol of Goddess Anapur from India makes sense. Oh, <laughs> all right, great. Thanks, Gaurav. Um, is that a Fender Jazz bass behind you? Yes, that is a Fender Jazz bass behind you. And it's newer than it looks, um, but it's not a vintage one. It's in my spare time. I do play a bit of music. Um, my fitness pal can help with this for Peggy J question. Thanks, Cooper. I'm thinking that's back to the nutrient question as well, too. Um, all right. So let's see. Um, we're really frustrated and not trying to figure out how to get enough micronutrients. So, um, with micronutrients, again, those are, you know, sometimes it's a little bit harder for people to be able to find. Um, you know, I am a, again, a huge proponent of eating the, um, the rainbow, you know, getting a wide variety of different micronutrients from different colors, you know, different colors equate to different nutrients. So trying to make sure that you're eating a wide variety of those nutrients is, um, or a wide variety of colors always helps with my nutrient intakes too. So, 
Um, we do cover micronutrients uh, quite a bit in some of the plant-based classes as well. Um, you might want to review some of that a little bit, but as far as trying to get enough, um, you know, you can definitely, uh, you know, start including some of those micronutrients in your food by doing, um, you know, again, that wide variety of different colors and try to add a wide variety of colors to each one of your dishes as well. Um, thanks for the session, Matia. And can kale be made a little softer? Or how can kale be made a little softer so I can use it without cooking? Uh, this has not been asked, Robin. You can totally do that. So uh, massaging is the answer. So if you want to have kale be a little bit softer, um, you want to take it to the spa, basically, right? So what I'll do personally is I'll take a little lemon juice or lime juice um, and maybe avocado or something. Um, but you don't have to add the fat, but I'll just massage the, um, you know, the, the kale uh, between my fingers to be able to um, make sure that it gets a little bit softer as well. So um, simple, easy way to be able to do that. So, um, all right. Looks like we also have uh, another one asking for email. So again, my email address is dan at ruby.com. So pretty simple if you have questions. Um, that you can help on or that you want to ask, you can definitely email me those as well. Um, so if there are any further questions, um, email me and we will help as best as we can. So thank you guys so much for joining our plant-based menu planning today. Um, that is going to conclude our class. I think I got through all of your questions. If I didn't, I apologize. And please just email me at dan at ruby.com. Um, enjoy your cooking and have fun with all of your classes with Ruby. There are wonderful ways to be able to get you in the kitchen, learning more about food and really helping a wide variety of diets and helping out your health at the same time. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.